Are you a fine artist interested in having your artwork in galleries? Are you confused about where to even start with getting gallery representation? Well, today's guest is going to share her journey with you from how she developed her painting style over the years to getting her work in multiple galleries across the U.S. We learned a ton from this conversation with Hina Alvarado, and we know that you will too. We cover everything from when to know when you're ready to the ins and outs of working with a gallerist, the financials, marketing, shipping, exclusivity, how to know which galleries to avoid, and much more. So let's dive in. Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Nina Alvarado is a prolific, self-taught artist who is represented by galleries across the United States. Her work has been featured in international and national magazines, blogs, and art technique books. I met Hina close to, I think, 15 years ago at the International Encaustic Conference in Massachusetts when we were randomly assigned to be roommates. Um, and it's been super fun to see her, her work change and grow and develop since then. Her primary mediums are oil and encaustic. She works part-time as a calculus teacher and paints full-time in her home studio in San Francisco, while also raising the two most adorable six-year-old twins. Wow, another right brain, left brain person. I love it. <laughs> Hina, welcome to the Stardust Society. We're so excited to chat with you today. Hello, I'm happy to be here and excited to talk to you both. It's so good to see your face after... 15 years? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> So we like to start our um, our interviews with hearing about your Stardust story. Um, I know you've done a wide variety of things in your life from teaching. And I know when we met, you were making music um, and doing encaustic painting. And now you're mostly doing oil paintings with some encaustic. So tell us how you got started and how you got to where you are today. Well, I've always done art but never actually did art like I would do it every once in a while um, and not actually do a lot of painting um, for some reason I just couldn't get myself to paint every single day um, I had a friend who would basically tell me that I was a waste of talent because Ouch. I could paint yeah it, <laughs> it wasn't she meant it in a nice way yeah but um I, you know, could paint and I could paint really well, but I wasn't doing anything with my art. And mm -hmm. so one day I randomly decided to take a class with Hilla Evans and uh -huh. it was an encaustic class. And I had actually no idea what encaustics was at that point. So I took a class with her just to, you know, get myself painting again and just fell in love with wax. And she liked me and took me on as her little apprentice and would, you know, just give me wax and give me um, a bunch of tools. And she just encouraged me. And then she um, kind of strong armed me into uh, joining the uh, encaustic group. I can't even remember the name. It's been so long. Um, but also um, to go to the encaustic conference where I mm -hmm. met you. Yeah. And so I went there and um, back then I was doing more abstract stuff. I was doing um, drawings of leaves and then doing multiple layers of these drawings in between uh, wax and creating this depth with it. So it was it was pretty abstract. It had a really sort of atmospheric quality. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. And so I was doing that for a while and then and this happened also happens also whenever I do music where I feel like. I'm not really doing art like I'm making this art, but I'm not really an artist. And it started to feel like I was just an assembler. You know, I was just putting things together. And so I really went through this whole crisis of, OK, I don't feel like I'm an artist. I just I'm hmm. I'm a collage 
person. And um, so the, I decided that I was, and this is around 2009, that I was going to challenge myself and really challenge myself, which for me, that meant painting people. I'd never painted people before 2009. And it always seemed like this impossible thing mm -hmm. that I just wasn't able to do. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to make myself paint people. But I still liked the wax and I wasn't sure how, is it gonna, how I was going to incorporate the wax with these paintings. And so I was basically doing these black and white um, images of people uh, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to complicate it with color because I figured, you know, it's hard enough to do people. I, I'm going to put off doing any sort of color till later. I think that's a great way to learn. Yeah. And um, my friend had bought a grocery bag full of old photos from a uh, flea market. And to me, that just seemed really sad. Like this is somebody's yeah. memories and somebody's past that another person just sold and he bought mm -hmm. for five bucks. Like he bought a grocery bag full of them for five dollars. Wow. And they there were some really incredible photos in there. And so I started drawing those and painting those photos. And um, it just became this thing where like I was drawing these people and it felt like I was also kind of being intrusive into their past. So I wanted a, a way to make these photos or these paintings into something that was more universal, you know, because to me, it always seems weird. Why would somebody want to buy another person's portrait? That, and, and that right, still feels right. weird to me. Like, w why would anybody want somebody else's portrait hanging in their house? It Some random person they don't right. know. Yeah, exactly. So I started putting these bars over their eyes and I'm like, okay, is this going to be creepy or not? And at that time I had one gallery representation. I had a uh, Stephanie Britbard fine arts and um, she randomly found me through open studios. And that was back when I was doing the leaf paintings and she really liked them. And so I, I, I showed them to her and I'm like, is this creepy or is this, am I onto something? And she's like, no, I don't find them creepy at all. I think you're onto something. And so mm -hmm. I started putting these bars over these, the eyes of these images of other people's memories. And it kind of took off from there where, you know, people started to really react to them. And I started getting all of these galleries wanting to sell my art. And, um, you know, and people always asking, are they, you know, why are you putting these bars over their eyes? <laughs> it, that was like the the big question. I, I must have answered that question at least, you know, thousands of times. And basically it was so that once we cover the eyes, these images weren't a specific person's memories in a, you know, about a specific person. It was now something more universal because you couldn't see the eyes. So it could be anybody. And the mm -hmm. thing that I loved about my art at that time was that people would come up to me and say, oh my God, that looks just like my great aunt, or that looks like my mom. You know, I have an image of my mom doing the same thing. And so it kind of bonded people to my paintings because they could relate more to them. And so I did that. Whereas if they could see the whole face, it would be somebody else. It wouldn't right. be, oh, that's my aunt. Yeah. yeah, it would be some strange person. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So um, I started doing that for a while and then that got old and I wasn't <laughs> sure what to do because once you're in a gallery and you're known for a specific art or a type of painting, you know, they don't really want you to change because that they know that that sells, you know, so it's really right. hard to then find something else that you want to do that people are going to react to in the same sort of way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I started painting um, the same, you know, vintage images of people, but using color blocks and I was showing their eyes and just like I thought, people don't want random people's <laughs> <laughs> portraits in their house. Like these paintings didn't sell. And my galleries were like, you know, yeah, we're not really into these. There's just nothing special about these paintings. And so, you know, I worked for a while and trying to figure out what am I going to do next? And I ended up doing this. I, I just love vintage photos. And so mm -hmm. for me, that was still going to be happening. Like I, I just couldn't get past wanting to do vintage photos right. and vintage images, especially of old Hollywood. Like I love the clothes and I love the glamour. Yeah. 
And you paint them beautifully. <laughs> Why, thank you. Um, so I started doing those images, but instead of putting the uh, the bars over the eyes, I was cropping the images so that you couldn't see the eyes. So it was basically from the nose down. And I, you know, would it would be mostly about the the clothing and um, you know, the the hand gestures and stuff. And then I was doing um these kind of patterned wallpaper backgrounds that were, you know in color so it was black and white images with colored backgrounds and back then it was just like one color you know pattern backgrounds and it's since uh, evolved to like multiple colors somebody once told me that i was basically a cross between kahindi wiley and um amy sherald because i was doing the black and white images of people but uh-huh. with a colored background. I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, I I could see where <laughs> like, where you get that. Um, so that's where I was, you know, um, not that long ago. And even then, as I was doing these, it started to feel like, OK, I'm I'm starting to get predictable. It's starting to feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. And what am I going to do to make me feel like an artist, like make me feel like I'm not just doing the same thing. Cause I, I never really understood how artists could do the same thing over and over and over again and not evolve, you know? And that to yeah. me seemed kind of boring and um, stagnant. So I started doing these, I call them passion projects because for me, they were side projects that I figured if they don't sell, it's OK, because I'm doing these for me to help me feel like a better person and a better artist and to to just challenge myself more. So the mm-hmm. first passion project that I did was of my students. Um, I teach at Ruth Asawa School of the Arts and I teach math there. And I these students, they are amazing. They know who they are. They are very vocal about it. We have a lot of um, gay students, trans students. Um, students who are political students who are out there protesting. And this was back when, you know, right before Trump. So there was a lot of things happening and they were out there protesting and they were very vocal about who they were and how they wanted to be referred to. Like before that, I never even knew about pronouns and and like the they pronouns, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, Wow. Like I learned so much from my students. And so I was doing these portraits of them, um, their whole face and just really zoomed up on their face with really high contrast shadows that I was taking in my classroom, but with their eyes closed. Um, Mm. And the whole thing about that was basically these kids, you know, they are so um, vocal and they act like adults and they have adult ideas, but they're they're still children, you know. What age kids are these? They were high school students. Okay. So a lot of juniors and seniors that I did images of or paintings of. And so when kids are asleep and their eyes are closed, they're very angelic. And we are reminded of no matter how crazy they are during the day. And my kids are my own children are super active and spirited and crazy during the day. But when they're asleep, they look so angelic. And you remember, oh, yeah, these are just kids, you know, no matter how Mm -hmm. much they drive you crazy. They're just kids. And so I was doing these paintings of my students with their eyes closed, kind of in that sense of, you know, if they were sleeping, that's when you are reminded that no matter what they are doing during the day and how vocal they are and how adult like they are, they're still kids, you know. And so I did 35 of those pieces. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative ended up buying 30 of them. And it's wow. now hanging in a. Uh, their offices. So that was my first passion project. And once again, I didn't think anybody would really react to them or, you know, but one of my galleries decided that they wanted to show it over at the uh, San Francisco Art Fair. Mm -hmm. And then it started to become a thing where they were showing whatever passion project I had, they would show it during the art fair. Wow. Nice. So that was nice. That's like, amazing. Was, <laughs> yeah. But um, the next series that I did was all on um, black children because, you know, my twins are black. And the thing that I, you know, that is so upsetting about black children and um, is that how people view them. And 
they're viewed as very cute and adorable when they're young. But once they hit a certain age, like around 13, then they're seen as threats, you know, Mm, and people start to become afraid of them. And so I started painting children with uh, superhero masks and basically a target behind them. But with the idea that, you know, these kids could be heroes. These kids could be presidents. They could be, you know, doctors, lawyers. They could be anybody if they were given the chance, if people would see them as potential heroes as opposed Mm -hmm. to potential threats. Yeah. And so I did a, a bunch of uh, paintings of I started with my children and then I just started painting, you know, all of these these black children who, you know, beautiful black children who could be anybody and could be anything that they wanted to be. If, if given a given, chance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I've, I've been doing a lot of passion projects on the side and that's what basically keeps me feeling like. I'm progressing. I'm not stagnant. I'm not just doing the same thing over and over again. And I still do, you know, the other paintings and I still do commissions. And those are basically what pays the bills. Right. It'd be it would be great if these passion projects also paid the bills. But (laughs) um, for me, they're more about me expressing myself and and learning and changing and growing. And with this pandemic recently, I started doing paintings of mothers with their children and they had these veils over them because, you know, throughout this whole pandemic, we're the ones that have had to give up so much to care for our children, to care for our households. We're working from home and we're still, you know, making sure our kids are learning and that everything is still as normal as possible when it's not normal, you know? And these veils basically to me represented, okay, so we're here, we're doing all these things, but are we really seen? Like, are people really understanding how much we've had to take on and how much we've had to do in order to make sure that our kids are okay? And especially, you know, mothers of color with all the Black Lives Matter stuff and the Asian hate stuff that's been happening, like, it's been really hard, you know, and I'm an Asian woman who has had to deal with watching my community being targeted and being hurt and also raising black children and having to worry about, you know, them growing up, especially my son. It's really scary to be a parent of black children right now, you know, knowing that they could they could die for something as stupid as having a toy gun. Right. So. Jogging in the wrong neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's super scary, you know, and having those conversations with my kids and, you know, my son, who's especially sensitive and especially observant, he'll ask me things like, you know, why do cops hate brown people? Why are they shooting brown people? You know, and he's six. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So these paintings of mothers were basically um, me showing how much we're strong people who are trying our best to raise our children and not really being seen and, you know, I guess given credit for all that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. So that's the recent um, passion project that I've been working on lately. I believe there's one of you in there, isn't there? Yes, there there is, (laughs) which is funny because my dad actually really hates that painting. (laughs) Really? <laughs> yeah, because he's like, you look so sad and the kids look so sad and, you know, and and you're not a sad person. Uh, and I had it as my profile pic for a while. He's like, you need to change that. You need to put something that's more reflective <laughs> of you. And so I think it's hilarious because I showed it to him and he's like, it looks like you, but I don't like it. I really don't like this painting. <laughs> you know. Um, well, but it gets the message across. Yeah, exactly. And I actually have another friend who um, showed her family the, the portrait and they're like, it looks like you, but we're so used to you being this happy go lucky, you know, woman. And this doesn't show that, you know, but I'm like, but that's the point. You know, we underneath everything underneath this happy exterior, we're we're having to battle so many things and having to deal with so many things in order to make sure that our kids are growing up happy and growing up, you know, as normal as possible during not normal times. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of the challenge of a lifetime, isn't it right now? Oh this my is something God. we never anticipated. 
Yeah, yeah. It's been it's been crazy. And now with Omicron going on, it's like, OK, do I send my kids back to school? You know, do I I'm supposed to be going to um, Mexico for my 50th birthday coming up. And now I'm like, OK, is that a good idea? Do I should I go? Do I you know, is it responsible? And there's just so many things to think about. And it's crazy. and It really is crazy. Yeah. So along the same lines, but changing up just a little bit. I always like to ask people how they juggle all the different things in their lives and how, how, what's the balance between, I know that you used to teach full time and paint on the side, but I noticed when you, the way you talk about it now, you're painting full time and teaching part time. Yeah. And I think you've actually, you've gone back and forth a few times with that. How are you juggling that stuff, balancing that stuff and the whole COVID and your kids at home and it's it's not easy. It is definitely not easy. Um, it was hard when we were working from home and the kids weren't in school and I wasn't in school um, in person and having to do all that from home. And so, you know, when I was teaching, my husband would watch the kids while he was working because I'm sorry, having twins do kindergarten on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Like they lasted 15 minutes if we were lucky, you know, like they, they basically didn't go to kindergarten because, you know, they went, they were doing zoom and there's no way you're going to keep kids on a computer listening to a teacher. Like if it's a video game or YouTube, my daughter would be on there 24 seven, but even my son, like after, you know, a couple of hours, he would get bored, but like to listen to a teacher and watch somebody, you know, teach them on zoom. 15 minutes was the most that they could do. And so he would watch the kids while I taught. And then I would watch the kids afterwards. And then at four o'clock, he would then take over with the kids and I would go down to my studio. And I'm fortunate that I have my studio downstairs for me. So, you know, it's it's an easy commute. But, you know, I would be down there and I would basically not have dinner with my kids and I wouldn't see them. And so I would be down there from four till about seven, eight o'clock come upstairs, put them to bed. And then I would have my downtime, you know, which Mm -hmm. by then I'm exhausted. And my downtime basically means I'm going to sleep. So (laughs) (laughs) that was not fun. And it was super exhausting. Sleep is a great hobby. (laughs) (laughs) I love sleep. Yeah. Um, So, you know, that's that's what we were doing for a while. And then they went back to school and um, and I went back to work. And I'm fortunate that I can, you know, teach. I'm basically 80 percent instead of 100 percent full time. Okay, and so that's that's more than just part time, though. (laughs) True. But so I I work at a school of the arts and the way that they they run it is academics are in the morning and then arts are in the afternoon. And so. Um, you know, three days a week, I'm done teaching by 11 o'clock. Oh, that's and two fantastic. two days a week, I'm done teaching at one. And while I'm supposed to stay at school, you know, for my prep and, and, and stay there, whatever 80% of the time is, I basically, I'm like, you know what, I'm leaving. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. I do my job. I do it well. My kids are learning. I'm well prepared. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to hang out at school just to hang out at school because I was supposed to be here for a certain number of time. And I'm sure my admin know it (laughs) at this point. I think they're just happy that they have teachers because there's such a teacher (laughs) shortage. Yeah. So I come home and I paint and I paint until my kids get out of aftercare, which is, you know, they usually get home around six and then, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, hang out with my kids and put them to bed. And so right now it's working. I teach two classes a day. I come home, I paint, I then pick up my kids. We have dinner, you know, we hang out for a little bit and then it's bedtime and then we do it all over again, you know, (laughs) and on weekends, my husband is really nice and he, you know, he'll at least give me Saturday where I can get up in the morning and paint until, you know, from like nine to like three o'clock And then, you know, so those days are always really nice because, you know, I, I like getting out of bed and not changing my clothes, not brushing my teeth or doing anything 
just like today <laughs> and just going downstairs and, and painting, you know, that to me, yeah, it, that's pretty much every day for me <laughs> since I started working at home in 2003. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, sometimes I'm like, is it even worth taking a shower at this point it's like three o'clock <laughs> like the day's almost over i'll you do know? it tomorrow right yeah so so yeah so that's basically how i juggle it you know and there's been some days where um i have a deadline where i, I have a big show and i have to paint during the night you know and i'll paint until i have to go to bed and i don't see much of my kids during that time i see them in the morning basically and you know that's hasn't happened much with COVID because right. nobody's doing solo shows at this point. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, you do what you have to do. And for me, you know, any moment that I can paint, I paint. And so when people are like, Oh, you know, you have some downtime, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, I'm going to paint. Like <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> all I ever do whenever I have extra time. And so, yeah, I've been called a machine before. And <laughs> You're pretty prolific. I, I looked at all of the collections that are on your website, and it's really impressive. We'll definitely link to those um, because we've talked about some of the different styles that you've had over the yeah. years. So we can link to those so people can see the visuals that go with this um, episode. But that is something interesting when we talk about, you know, style and how your style has progressed. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you today was because you have gallery representation and not just one gallery, but multiple galleries. And we know that a lot of our listeners might be interested in having their artwork in galleries, but they're still in those starting phases. Right. So we'd love to learn a little bit more from you about how that first gallery representation started. I think you mentioned you had these beautiful leaves and someone um, was attracted to that. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that and then how that progressed to the other galleries. Okay. So for a while... You know, when I first started painting, I didn't have any gallery representation, you know, like most people. Mm -hmm. And I was doing open studios. I was entering any sort of, you know, juried art show that I could get into and, you know, just kind of building my resume that way. And so the first gallery that I got was Stephanie Britbard Fine Arts, and she still represents me, um, although now as Simon Britbard Fine Arts. But she basically came to my open studios. And she saw my work and she liked it. And this was back when she had a gallery out of her house. She was basically having clients come to her house and oh, wow. um, look at work and selling it out of her house. And then she's now grown. She's got they now have two galleries, one in Menlo Park, one in San Francisco. And um, so I started off with her. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, uh, people started seeing my artwork there and. Once the whole social media stuff started and having websites, you know, were easy to, mm -hmm. to have, like um, it became so much easier to get galleries because other artists were seeing my work. And the the way that I got most of my galleries was from having other artists like my work and saying, hey, I really like your work. I think my gallery would would like your work also. And then ah, they would show my work nice. to them and then I would get, you know galleries that way i think out of all the galleries that i've ever had only one did i get from submitting work and saying hey you know doing that cold call of right you know i like your gallery and here's my work and i think it'd be a good fit and i only had one gallery actually respond to that and she actually responded within seconds which i think wow. that was funny um and and emailed me and said yes you know, mm -hmm. I would love some of your work, but for the most part, it's been, you know, other artists liking my work, um, gallerists going to other galleries, seeing my work there and liking it. Um, you know, at least every year I, I get two to three galleries uh, emailing me saying, Hey, you know, um, I saw your work online or I saw your work at another gallery or, you know, sometimes they don't even say anything. And, you know, I think that your work would be a good fit with my gallery. Let's let's give it a try. And, you know, they don't always they don't all work out. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot, a lot of galleries uh, show my work and they all don't work out. Show your work there. 
Sometimes it work sells, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's a market for your stuff there. Sometimes there isn't. And, you know, and, and if it doesn't work out, you say, okay, thank you. You know, thanks for giving it a try. And then, then you move on to the next gallery that wants to try you out. You know, um, I have two galleries that have basically have shown my work, have sold my work throughout my whole career. And that is Simon Britbart Fine Arts and Art House. Art House um, has always shown my work from pretty much from the beginning, maybe not from the same beginning as Simon Britbard, but you know, within a year or two of that. And um, are both of those galleries in your local area? Um, yes. Art house is in San Francisco. And so is Simon Britbard. Um, she, she lives in Mill Valley. Um, so originally she was showing my work in Mill Valley, but now um, it's shown in Menlo Park and in San Francisco. And then art house has now um, gone more virtual. And so the two owners, um, one owner moved to Palm Springs. So now he's showing my work in Palm Springs. Oh, I can so see your work in Palm Springs. And the other owner is is still in San Francisco. So, you know, but yes, they, they are my local galleries and they basically are the ones that sell the most paintings of mine. And people in the Bay Area tend to like my work more than other places. I seem to sell more work here than East Coast or even um, Southern California. Yeah, it's it's been interesting to see. I have a zillion questions based okay. on everything you just said, but I'm going to try to take this in a certain order. Okay. So I want to go back to getting started with galleries. You were super fortunate that somebody happened to come to your open studio and see your work and love it. And that's amazing. But I know that you've also done approaching galleries. So our listeners, for the most part, are in the getting started phases. And we have we talk a lot about the fear of getting started, knowing when you're ready. So how would you recommend getting started and knowing when you're ready and making those first approaches? Well, the thing that people need to understand is that when you're going to show in a gallery, you have to have a really big body of work because they're going to expect five to 10 pieces generally, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, so you need to be able to have at least that many pieces that are consistent and mm -hmm. um, in style and in quality in order to give that to them. And let's say another gallery decides that they want you, well, they're going to need that amount of paintings also. So having a large body of work is always good because one you're painting, right? And right. you're developing your style, you're developing the quality of your work, and you're also building a body of work so that galleries can have a large amount of paintings when they need it and when they want mm -hmm. it. So if you have more than one gallery, you know, that you you probably need easily 20 paintings, you know? Right. And so having that large body of work, if you only have a couple of paintings, it's not going to be worth you approaching galleries because you're not going to be able to provide the work for them. Right. That's so, a good tip for sure. So having a large body of work, having a large consistent body of work, um, and then just making sure that you're posting it everywhere because once people start liking your work and especially other artists starting following other artists, you know, mm -hmm. and commenting on other artists' work. So that way they notice your work and they check your work out that's how you make connections and relationships. You know, I've had so many other artists like my work and then say, you know, I'm going to talk to my gallery. Let me, let me see if, if they would show your work because I think your work is great. You know, that's how I got most of my galleries. Um, so building those relationships with other artists while you're still building your body of work. So that way mm -hmm. you have relationships, you have large amounts of art and then, you know, and then start approaching galleries and start looking at their websites and start checking out to see um, what artists they re represent. For a while, I was in the same galleries with like the same five artists. It, it, it was like, oh, you show this person's artwork? Of course you do. <laughs> and now you show mine because apparently we all go together in, in a group, you know. So um, it's really that's funny. Interesting. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then that's another way that you can also check out other galleries. So, oh, well, you know, this guy, this artist I like, you know, and my artwork, I think, works good with that artist. Um, what other galleries are this are they in? And then you start approaching those galleries, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you can't do any of that unless you have a large body of work. And how do you think you know if you're a good fit or not for a specific gallery? 
Um, looking at their art, if you're a figurative artist and you're approaching a gallery that does all abstract, obviously you're not going to be a fit, right? Yeah. Um, if you're a figurative artist and you're looking at other galleries and they're doing more Western type art or I don't know, like thematically it's not the same, then you know you're not a good fit. So looking at galleries that show the same genre of work, the same um, quality of work, the same type of images without being exactly the same, because then they won't want you because they already have an artist like you, right? Yeah, you got to find that sweet spot where you're similar enough that it goes well together, but not so similar that it's competing with something they already have. Exactly, exactly. And so, yeah, just, you know, going through the artist lists of other galleries and seeing what they have. And, you know, once you start getting one, it's easier to then see what kind of other artists you're that you're showing with to then mm-hmm. find those other artists in other galleries because you know then you'll be a better fit because you've already shown with these artists if that makes sense yeah i think there's also probably it'd be kind of a fun exercise to look at the gallery and try to pick out what it is that their aesthetic has in common you know like try to figure out okay i can see what this gallerist is going for Right. And see if you fit in with that. Yep. And then, you know, it's it's a lot of trial and error. You just, you give it a try. And if it works, awesome. And if not, you can't take it personally. And then you just move on. You know, there's a lot of uh, galleries and there's a lot of places that you can show your art. And it's not a competition and it's not, you know, something that you have to be jealous of another artist because they're getting all these shows and you're not. And there's plenty of places for everyone to show their art and understanding that and knowing that, okay, well, if this place didn't show, this isn't responding to my art, find someplace else. There's always someplace else. Are there any red flags that people should look for? (laughs) You know, because you've had a lot of experience with so many different people. Please don't name names. But (laughs) is there any advice that you could provide to say, you know, if if you see this, that's probably something that you should avoid? Well, I've I've had a couple of galleries who have bounced checks, who have sold artwork for way less than what you want to sell it for. Um, my best advice is when you get approached by a gallery or you're approaching a gallery, always talk to an artist who's already represented by them um, because they will let you know what the relationship is like. Yeah, that's really good advice. Because, yeah, there's there was one gallery. And once we figured out that this woman was basically ripping us all off, you know, then any time that we would see somebody else say, oh, I'm now represented by this gallery. You know, it's like, okay, time to email that person and say, hey, just so you know, yeah, this is what's happened, you know, or they should be reaching out to you. And, and, you know, I do get other artists reaching out to me and saying, Hey, I saw that you were represented by so-and-so, you know, what, how was that like? And, you know, can you give me any information about them? So, you know, always doing your research anytime that you are approached by a gallery or you're approaching a gallery and making sure that they're not going to do things like bounce checks or, Mm -hmm. you know, um, Mm -hmm sell your work for half the amount that you're supposed to be selling your work for and, you know, Mm -hmm. things like that. So it, you know, and and it does happen. There are definitely places where you don't have honest people and um, work is not cared for and um, they don't treat their artists very well. Right. So how does that work with the pricing though? I mean, do you have an agreement about what the prices are when you deliver work to them? And I mean, are they contractually obligated to sell at a certain price or? Yeah. Um, so basically at this point in my life and in my career, I have my prices set. Mm-hmm. And so whenever a gallery wants to talk to you about showing your work, they will always ask, OK, can you give me your price list? Mm-hmm. Because. You know, sometimes you are way too expensive for their clientele and they'll let you know and then it doesn't work. Or sometimes you're too cheap, you know, in which case they'll be like, "Okay, this doesn't work. But if, you know, you're right around the same prices as their other artists, then that's when, you know, it works out. And generally um, you agree to not more than 20 percent discounts. And that's usually to like 
designers, you know, who recommend mm-hmm. your work or, or to um, whenever they sell multiple pieces of your work or a client buys like a bunch of pieces from the gallery and they'll mm-hmm. offer a discount. So, mm-hmm. you know, 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent usually is the max that that you agree to giving a discount for. And if you're really lucky, you'll get a gallery that takes that out of their percentage. And I have one gallery that does that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I was going to ask that next. But for the most part, you split that. So they take 20% off the top and then you get 50% of that amount. Yeah. So you're in four different galleries right now? Um. Yeah, I you know it's so funny because like I don't even remember at this point, but I have, <laughs> I have my two that my my all is my two um, now uh, because Art House has split to Art House and James Bocci Contemporary. I now have three, and then I have Canfin, um, which is in uh, Westchester, so that's four, and then I have an art consultant in. Texas, so that's five. So yes, I think that's okay. Five. So I have a couple questions about that. Okay, first, how does it work with multiple galleries in the same geographical area? Because I thought a lot of times galleries want sort of exclusive in yeah. within a certain mile radius. So how does that work with more than one in San Francisco? Um, well, that is an anomaly because you're right. Usually galleries want, some of them want just exclusivity for the whole state. Some want mm-hmm. for the region or the city. Um, I know that uh, Simon Britbard wants exclusivity uh, for all of Northern California. But when I started with them and with Art House, um, Simon Britbard was in Mill Valley. Um, they because they were basically working out of their home and their home gallery, um, they weren't asking for exclusivity. And so once they grew to a two gallery, you know, organization, they were asking their artists to be exclusive. And um, I hope nobody's listening to this, but (laughs) no, I hope everybody's listening to this. Well, we hope everybody (laughs) except maybe one gallery. (laughs) Right. Um, So, during the time that they were asking for exclusivity, I was um, going through cancer treatments. Mm-hmm. I uh, got diagnosed with breast cancer. And so um, they were like, okay, we don't want to stress you out. We're not going to ask for exclusivity. We're just going to keep things the way that they are. And Art House was fine with, you know, me having another gallery. And um, which I am so happy because I don't know who I would have picked. Like I would have had to pick between two of the most nicest galleries that have taken such good care of me and have sold Mm -hmm. so much of my work. I I would have not known who to pick. So, um, so yeah, so they didn't ask me to, you know, to pick. Um, And now that art house is now a virtual gallery, it's not really an issue because they're not yeah. a brick and mortar gallery. So, but right. yeah, you are correct where galleries will ask you to choose you or, you know, they'll, they'll see that, oh, you're represented by this person. So we can't represent you because we want exclusivity. Right. And are there ever any concerns about a specific body of work and exclusivity there? Like saying, we want this entire collection. You can't sell this type of work to another gallery, even if it's across the country. Um, that hasn't happened so far. <laughs> Yeah, let's hope it doesn't. Um, right, <laughs> um, but you know there is there are galleries that want right of first refusal, where they mm-hmm. want to be able to see whatever new work that comes out first. Um, that does happen for me. You know, I post my work on Instagram or on uh, Facebook, and usually one of my galleries will say, "Can I have that?" Mm-hmm. And whoever says that first gets it. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but for the most part, it's if, if I'm working on a show for a gallery, everything goes to them. They get to right. decide whether or not they, right. they want those works. And then whatever is left over, then, um, you know, I'll offer that up to my other galleries. Um, at this point, I just post things. And if a gallery wants it, they'll let me know. Um, That's because, lovely. Yeah, because nobody's <laughs> nobody's, you know, really doing shows at this point. Right, so. right. So, yeah, so that's how it's been working. And for somebody who's just getting started, let's say that they get approached by someone or they approach someone and it's a good fit. 
Do you immediately sign a contract? How does the agreement work? Some galleries have contracts. Some galleries don't. I have to say that I definitely have a couple of galleries that don't have contracts and you have to really trust them and yeah. they have to trust you. Um, I would say always try to get a contract. Um, so that way it's spelled out on there, you know, what your work is going to be selling for. What is the largest discount they'll give you? Um, who takes care of shipping? You know, what happens if the work gets damaged? I was curious about shipping and, and especially if you're shipping your work to a gallery that isn't in your state, right? Yeah. That's representing you. And then they're having to ship it to the customer if they don't live in the place where they're purchasing the artwork. Yeah. So generally the way that it works is you ship to them, they ship to customers or back to you if the work doesn't sell. Yeah. Uh, I know that Simon Britbard pays for all shipping. Even nice. Shipping work to them. Um, I live in the area, so I don't really need to worry about that with them. Mm -hmm. But um, that is an anomaly also, because most places you ship to them and you pay for that and then they ship back if something doesn't sell. So it's not cheap to start off with a gallery because you're having to ship a ton of paintings. And if it's right. across the country, you know, that's easily like eight to 800 to a thousand dollars, depending on how you're shipping it. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's not cheap. <laughs> do you ship everything stretched already or do you ever unstretch things? Well, I have to do mine on panels on wood panels because mm. of the encaustic wax. So, um, Got it. everything is already assembled and they're huge boxes or crates and it's not and heavy cheap at all yeah. yeah oh yeah it's heavy yeah and with encaustic wax not everything gets there unharmed yeah so i used to work in encaustic as well so i understand that especially yeah. you know you have to deal with um anything that's too cold or anything that's too hot yeah. right yeah yeah and right now i'm ha actually having to deal with you know um a gallery shipped a 48 by 48 painting or maybe it was a 36 by 48 painting to hawaii and it was created and there's these three tiny little chips on the edges and we're like trying to figure out how do we get that repaired because if they ship it back and then I repair it and th they ship it back to the client one there's no guarantee it's not it's not going to be you know uh chipped again but also by that point they've already lost money on whatever they made from selling the painting so you know right now we're trying to figure out how to get that repaired and I'm hoping that Maybe there's somebody in Hawaii who is an encaustic artist that can help out. If not, um, yeah, it's it's hard to figure this stuff out. But for the most part, if that ever does happen, if a painting does get damaged, you know, you're responsible for fixing it mm -hmm. and making sure that the client then gets the painting, you know, fixed. And sometimes you do lose money on that, you know, but yeah. Um, because you mentioned that it's normally 50-50, right? The yeah. split. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about contracts and do they specify a time period? Like, you know, if you're just getting started with someone, do they do like, well, we're going to take you on as a trial basis for six months and then reassess or you're exclusive with us for three years or how does how does that work? It's generally six months, sometimes a year, depending on the mm -hmm. gallery, will, where they will take your work. Um, it's on consignment. And if nothing sells or not enough paintings sell to show that they have a market for you, then they will send it back after six months or a year, depending on the gallery. But yeah, uh, usually you're on there with it for a trial period. Yeah. And have you ever had a, a case or do you know of cases where if you have a contract for a year, but you don't like the way they're doing something, so you want to get out of the contract or nothing is sold in six months, so they want to break the contract and get, have you dealt with yeah. that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and often because, you know, yeah. it, you, it's it's all trial and error. You, you, right. you send your work out and you hope for the best. And yeah. some galleries are very understanding. Like when I started with Art House, nothing sold for the first six months, like actually for the first eight months. And I was like, okay, they're going to drop me because nothing is selling. Right. But for them, they, they were like, you know what? It takes a while for people to see your work. 
to have that, you know, have them think about your work and then have them come back for your work. And sometimes it takes at least six months. So they were very understanding and knowing that, you know what, we're not going to automatically drop you because nothing has sold for six months. It takes that long for people to see your work on a regular basis to then understand it and want to buy it. And so after like eight months, you know, then my work started selling and then it started selling a lot, you know, and some galleries understand that. And other galleries, you know, they're like, okay, six months has happened. Nobody has bought your work. Sorry, it didn't work out. See ya. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and then you say, okay, thanks. And, you know, you don't argue and you get your work back and then you try it again someplace else, you know, but um I, I think Art House has it right where it does take time for people mm-hmm. to really, you know, get to know your work. And especially if it's something that is not just decorative, mm-hmm. you know, where it's something that you really have to think about. And for me, when I had those paintings with the bars over their eyes, it really took a while for people to understand what those paintings were about, you know, and. Sometimes it took six to eight months for people to understand that. And some galleries were like, "Okay, six months happened and nothing sold. We're done. You know, this kind of leads us into the marketing discussion. So what exactly does a gallery do for you in that example you gave us? Maybe somebody walks into the gallery and they they're thinking about it and they come back later. But what proactive things does a gallerist do for you to help market your work? Well, they obviously one uh, show of your work in the gallery, but uh, a lot of galleries will send out emails saying, okay, we are not representing this artist or we have new work from this artist or, you know, some sort of introduction. Um, They have client lists that they, you know, will contact and say, Hey, we've got this new artist who we think that you'll really like, and, you know, start emailing them about your work and sending them images of your work. So they're constantly contacting clients or at least the good galleries are constantly contacting clients that they think would like your work anytime you have any new piece out hey you know Hino Alvarado has a new piece out and this is it let me show it to you and you know get let you see it first and Mm -hmm. decide whether or not you want to buy this or stuff you know so they're constantly doing things like that um, having, obviously having solo shows and putting out the postcards, although most galleries don't put out postcards anymore. It's now all like green, you know? Yeah. I was just yeah. thinking when I first started, when I got out of art school and first started approaching galleries, like in the nineties, <laughs> um, yeah, there was no internet, there weren't yeah. websites there, you know, so it was, uh, sending out postcards and sometimes the gallery would do that. Sometimes they wouldn't. Yeah. And I love those postcards. <laughs> I know. I know. I still have so many stacks of them. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have some of yours, actually. <laughs> nice. But um, and then they used to run galleries would run ads in magazines. Yeah. I don't know if they're still doing that or if it's just all online now. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of galleries are still doing that. I know Canfin um, would run ads in different magazines. Mm-hmm. Um and then they actually put out this beautiful brochure mm-hmm. every time. And then they mail those brochures to their clients. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually one of the few galleries that still does any sort of paper kind of advertisement for you. But for the most part, you know, galleries, it's all email or all, you know, posting your work on Instagram or taking your work to art fairs. Art fairs are a huge place for clients to get to know your work. Mm-hmm. Um So doing things like that is really what most galleries are doing at this point, I think. So you mentioned the social media that they would post on their social media, but that brings up a good question um, because I know in a lot of different areas of art, as well as in publishing world and other places, it's expected that an artist would have a specific number of followers before they're even looked at sometimes. So from a gallery perspective, do they expect you to have a certain amount of social media followers? Um, No, mostly because most of the galleries that I've gotten, it was pre Instagram. So you've been with them for a while. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I haven't had um, very many galleries say that you have to have, um, I haven't had any galleries actually say that I had to have a certain number of followers 
on Instagram. And I don't even know, you know, Instagram is one of those places where I, I'm a little confused. I just don't understand <laughs> how your work is seen and liked. And, you know, like I have just under a thousand followers, which in Instagram world is nothing, you know, but like, right. There's, I, I don't have like a thousand, you know, likes on my images and stuff. And so I don't know how that algorithm works of, you know, who's seeing your work and how often they're seeing your work. And, you know, I see other artists who have thousands of likes and, you know, thousands of, of followers. And there's always, I constantly get emails or direct messages or comments on my paintings of, we can get you lots of followers, you know, you should pay us money to, you know, and I did that once. (laughs) Yeah. I did that once and I'm like, okay, yeah, this doesn't actually work. And, um, you know, because no, they'll get they'll get you followers, but the half the followers are also fake. Not real. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they're, they aren't followers who are liking your work. And right. if they're not going to like right. your work, then they're basically not followers. Yeah. There's no point. Yeah. So I, I don't I haven't quite figured out how to navigate the whole social media stuff, you know, and how to get followers and how to get likes and. I assume that that, those lead to sales. Sometimes. I think they do for some. Yeah. But also, it's good to know that your work stands on its own and speaks for itself. You know, like it doesn't like you have successful gallery representation and you're not concerned about what numbers people have to have in their followings. Right. Yeah. Uh, And so that's very encouraging. Yeah. Fortunately for me, you know, (laughs) my following doesn't seem to affect my sales. <laughs> so, yeah. Let me ask you this. So you're selling originals in the galleries. Do you have the ability, if you wanted to, to sell prints of those pieces at all, like online in your own shop or anything like that? Uh, generally, they the galleries don't like that unless they make an agreement with you to sell the prints at their um, gallery because basically you're um, making the piece less valuable by selling prints of that piece. So when Mm -hmm. I do prints, I do them of pieces that I am not selling in a gallery. Got it. So that way it's not competing with that. And even some galleries don't even like you selling prints because why would you then buy a painting when you can get a cheaper print? You know, so for me, I've only recently started doing prints mostly because I was doing um, these fundraisers for charities. And so I do prints of paintings that are not in style with what I sell in galleries. That makes sense. And I happen to have a beautiful print of yours. Oh, which one? (laughs) Uh, It's the woman holding a camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of my my very first uh, paintings from my um, my Wallflower series. Yes, yes. It's Um, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, so at this point, I only do prints of paintings that are not... um, in galleries or if it is in a gallery then i change it so that it's not competing with it so i'll make it smaller or Mm -hmm. you know it's somehow different so that it's not competing Mm -hmm. and you know some galleries are fine with prints but um do most galleries want larger work i assume they're not looking for smaller pieces yes (laughs) the larger the better um what's the average size of the work you do i know it varies but 48 by 48 seems to be the size that um, sells best. 36 by 36, 48 by 48. Um, I have gone larger than that, um, but it's really hard with encaustic wax. And I yeah. I do completely smooth surfaces, you know, which are really hard to start with. Yep. Doing that on a very large painting. Um, oh, Yeah it's wears on your body. Like it, it takes me a while to recover physically from it, but it, it is really hard to do and they get super heavy, you know, and then there's the whole thing of, okay, well, how do I get that to a gallery? Mm-hmm. You know? And fortunately 
the larger pieces tend to stay in San Francisco or in the Bay Area. But, you know, having to ship a really large piece is really expensive. And oh, yeah. It's it's scary because, you know, they could arrive damaged and then you just spent all this money, you know, <laughs> shipping a damaged painting that needs to mm-hmm. come back. So, um, but yeah, galleries tend to like large pieces. That makes sense. Yeah. They sell for more. They look great on large walls, especially if they're going to do some sort of corporate, you know, sale. There's large walls. And a lot of the times paintings that are that feel large to me like a 48 by 48 painting you mm-hmm. hang it in a gallery and it looks like a postage stamp you know right. yeah that's true <laughs> like, right that, did, that didn't look so large which is an interesting thing to think about because i mean okay so once i'm on the bus i'm not going to have any walls but <laughs> currently where i live I don't have a wall big enough for a painting that big. So what might look tiny in a gallery will overpower a house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it depends on who your market is because, right. um, well, yes, the, the market in San Francisco probably have larger walls. <laughs> yeah. Well, for the clients that can afford, you know, large works, yes. yes, they definitely have large walls. And then there's, you know, a lot of people who live in San Francisco homes, you know, where there isn't a lot of, a lot of wall space. And so, you know, you want to be able to provide them smaller works so that way those clients can also access your work mm-hmm. and buy pieces. Right. But for the most part, large pieces sell best. And do you find that you have a lot of collectors that come back again and again for your work? Yes. Yes. And awesome. which is nice. And and for me, that's a little confusing because like how many pieces of the same type of work can you have in, in your house? It which, depends how big your house is. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but like, you know, that I've always wondered that. I'm like, it, and, and granted, I do have a couple pieces from like, you know, some of the same artists in my house. But, you know, at what point do you saturate that market? And yeah. you know, this is always yeah. like something that's going on in my head as I'm thinking about, you know, all my work that sells in San Francisco. And I'm like, at what point do you saturate the market? And then there's no market for you anymore, you know? Um, but these are the things that... I worry about at like two in the morning and, you know, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to have been a problem so far. So far. So has hopefully not been a problem. it won't be. Yeah. And then new people are going to find you all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> so one of the things we like to ask um, is, are there any questions that we didn't ask that we should have? Um, trying to think. No, I, I guess we love to stump people with this. One. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I've talked a lot, you know, uh, <laughs> where do you see yourself in five years? Well, hopefully in five years, I have retired from teaching and I am mm-hmm. painting full time at home and I'm able to make a living off of just selling my art. I mean, that's the dream, right? Like, absolutely. I mean, that's that would be lovely. Dream. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, I have two kids and a mortgage and, you know, I like being able to successfully support my family doing art, you know, would be amazing. Um, yeah. And there's some months where I'm like, hey, I could definitely do that. And then other months where I sell absolutely nothing. And I'm like, OK, we would starve this month. We would starve. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you find, though, that that it kind of I mean, my business is the exact same way, you know, doing doing web design and other design for for clients. You know, I might have a month where I'm like, wow, I've met my goals for the first six months of the yeah. year and then nothing else comes in for the next four months. So um, but do you find that it kind of averages over the course of the year? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um there's definitely hopefully with a steady slow incline <laughs> over the years. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's definitely been good years and bad years. And surprisingly, um, the pandemic has been some of my best years of selling art. Oh, really? Well, I think that's because everybody is stuck at home looking at their boring walls yeah, and they're like, yeah. man, I need to up my art game. <laughs> yeah. Like the two, my two San Francisco galleries have had their best years these past two years for that wow. exact reason. Yeah. You know, people have time to figure out what they want to do with their house. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm myself, I've like rearranged art. I, I redid my bathroom and I'm like, okay, I need all new art in there, you know? So I, I get why yeah. art yeah. is definitely selling more this year. 
But yeah, there's definitely hard years and where you're like, why am I doing this? Like nobody right. likes my art. Nobody's buying my art, you know? And I think for an artist, there's always that self doubt. And that's, there's always oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. feeling of I'm not a real artist or, you know, there's no way I can survive off of doing my art. Why doesn't anybody like my art? Does everybody hate my art? Does everybody hate me? Like, why am I doing this? Should I just quit? Like <laughs> these questions are constantly going in our heads. Right. And you know, it's unfortunately. So what do you do to get yourself out of that thinking? Do you have, you know, sometimes I, I need to just take a break and, um, I know enough at this point that those feelings will go away mm -hmm. and that something will sell and I'll feel good about myself. And, you know, that these are just, you know, it's, it's self doubt that is always going to happen. And you, it's, it's kind of like for me with depression, you know, I'm clinically depressed. So there are times where I'm super, super depressed and I'm old enough at this point to know, okay, you know what? I'm going to feel like shit for a couple of days and then it's going to go away and I'm going to feel like normal again. Right. You know, I just need to write this out. And so yeah. same thing with the self doubt with painting, you know, I need to just write this out and then mm -hmm. it'll be fine again. And then, you know, and understanding that that's going to happen and that you'll get through it and it'll pass and it always does pass. Mm -hmm. And then you start working again, you know, so it's just making sure that you understand that whatever's happening isn't ever permanent. You know, things change so often that you just have to write out whatever is happening at that time. Yeah, That's absolutely. So true. Yeah. Well, Hina, where can our listeners find you online? Well, I do have a website. Uh, it's just HinaAlvarado.com. I do have Instagram, which is just Hina underscore Alvarado. Um, I'm on Facebook also, and I do post my art there, but most of it is, um, most of my postings are about my kids. So if you <laughs> want to <laughs> see pictures of my kids and listen they're to adorable, <laughs> so you really do. <laughs> and they're hilarious. Like the comments that they come up with and, you know, <laughs> the things that they do are just hilarious. So if, you know, I welcome followers on Facebook, but understand that that's a lot of stuff about my kids. Yeah, but I've enjoyed seeing them grow up since, I mean, I remember right when you got them. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so, yeah. And, and like yeah. even before then where I was like, okay, we might get babies. Like, yes. you know, because my kids, if, for those who don't know, my kids are adopted and we waited, you know, a good year and a half of like, are we going to get kids? Are we not? And what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, and and then like with less than 24 hours notice, here's two newborns, you know? Wow. So, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been an interesting uh, journey with the kids and, you know, Facebook has everything on there about that. And Instagram <laughs> is all about just art. It's just art. And it's, you know, a lot of process shots and um, I need to post more. I need to be more consistent with posting on there. We all do. We all yeah. do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been really fun to, to follow you. Um, what's, what's one piece of advice that you can give to artists who are just getting started? Paint a lot every single day. Even if you don't want to paint, even if you have nothing to paint, you need a, you need to make a practice of painting every single day. It's your job. If you want yeah. to make a career of this, this is your job. You go in there and you paint even when you don't want to, even if it means just gessoing panels, you know, or um, painting something and then painting over it later because you didn't like it. You need to get in the habit of painting all the time, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's just two hours a day. Like I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I have kids and I don't know how do I carve out time to paint? You're like, you know what? When the kids are taking a nap, paint, even if it's just an hour, you know, you need to paint every single day. And if the kids are asleep, you know, and you need to paint when they're after they're in bed, then do it. But if you're not doing it every single day, you're never going to make this a career. You know, you need to get that body of workout. And if you're not painting how is that going to happen well especially if you want to be in five galleries right <laughs> right right you need a lot of That's work 50 paintings yeah but also I, I think the thing that that took me forever to understand is that not every piece that you paint is going to be a masterpiece 
like to for me, I would get so upset when I would paint something and it wouldn't sell or people weren't reacting to it or, you know, and you need to understand that, like, you may do 10 paintings and two of them might be great. The mm-hmm. rest might be crap or maybe four yeah. of them are mediocre, you know? Yeah. And to be OK with that, that's why you paint all the time, because the more you paint, the more chances you have of coming up with that masterpiece, you know, or that piece that's yeah. going to sell or that piece that that everybody's going to react to. But you're going to have to paint a lot of crap before you get there, you know? Yeah. And even after that masterpiece, you may end up painting more crap before you come up with your next <laughs> one. And that's going to happen. And, you, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get a couple of masterpieces in a row. But, you know, you're never going to get there if you don't paint. And you have to do yeah. that every day. Well, Hina, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We've really enjoyed our conversation. And I know our listeners are going to get so much value from your story and your advice on getting gallery representation. Well, thank you for having me. This has been fun. Yeah, seriously. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to see your face again. (laughs) (laughs) It's nice seeing you too. To learn more about Hina and read today's Stardust Society show notes, go to stardustsociety.com slash Hina Alvarado. And that's spelled J-H-I-N-A-A-L-V-A-R-A-D-O. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend. Sharing helps us reach more Stardusts like you and keeps us inspired to create new episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.